Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right. So, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about, about the fourth man principle. Um, I sincerely believe that God has his hand on, on every life that is here tonight. Every one of you, God has his hand on your life. Uh, I personally happen to believe that at this time in my journey, that that is the case for all humanity. Whether we experience that um, in a form of manifest uh, blessing and favor is another, another question, another debate. Maybe we'll touch on that a little bit tonight as I share a little, some of my own personal, personal story. Um, I used to talk very flippantly at one time in my life about um, what I thought was the favor and the blessing of God, which does exist, but um, the one thing I was not conscious and aware of was, was how that can interpret sometimes to people who, who have faced or are facing disaster in their life. For example, I have dear friends probably be listening to this because they listen to most of our podcasts. Hi, Jim and Lorna. Uh, Jim Her and Lorna Herring in, uh, in um, McGregor, Texas, who whose son, Rhett, was uh, killed in a tragic accident um, just a year ago this, this Christmas, just as a, a young 13-year-old boy. And um, uh, it can sound a little hollow to people like that if we don't approach the issue of God's favor and God's blessing in a, in a correct way, because the question they can ask is, what about me? What happened to me? You've got that family right now down in London with a little baby with the incurable disease who uh, just longing for more time with their child when it seems inevitable that, that, that he will die. Now, de death doesn't really bother me because I, I actually think death is a grace, and that's, again, another story. I've come to believe death is a grace um, that at times blesses our life to, to release us into another dimension that, that, that we would be better to be in. Um, so, so when we look at these things, we, we, we have to have a consciousness of that, but then must not be intimidated uh, into being unwilling to speak of the favor and blessing of God and how God works in our life, because His hand is definitely upon our lives. And uh, sometimes we are fighting against where God is positioning us, because we don't understand what is happening. And... Uh, for all of us, there is a positioning process that goes on. Uh, where, whether we have come to personal faith in, in, in who Christ is, or whether we haven't, there is, a, there is an unseen momentum and motion that is, is all the time positioning us, uh, but we often fight it because we don't really understand what's happening. And a lot of what I want to say to you tonight is sometimes we have lost, we've lost the willingness to... First of all, believe in the goodness of God, and secondly, to absolutely commit and submit the process of our whole life into God's hands, knowing that within that process there is good, and there is help, and there is provision, and there is blessing for all that we are going through. Um, that unseen hand, again, because I know Chris and I have long conversations about this because we come from very different um, perspectives, even in terms, it seems like you would think we'd be the same, both growing up in church with, you know, her parents in ministry, my parents in eldership and leadership, and, uh, but we actually, we, we had very different upbringings and have very different concepts of, of, of what we think the God was that was, was related to us. So sometimes when I talk about, um, you know, the hand of God or God positioning us, we, we, we can have discussions about that. Uh, but I see the unseen hand of God uh, a little like the hand of the conductor who's conducting the orchestra. If you follow the conductor's hand and you're willing to participate in the music, 
what is produced is a symphony. If you don't follow the conductor's hand, what you produce is a noise, an irritating, terrible, awful noise. There's nothing worse than an out-of-tune orchestra. I, for some of you, this is not a judgment, but I can't understand how you sing out of tune. Uh, it, it actually, um, it, it's actually to do, you know, people who know this stuff will tell you it's to do because the ears are not listening closely enough. It's not that you can't sing, it's that you're not listening properly to what it is that you're supposed to sing. It's actually a lazy ear that is not fully connecting. So, so I don't see the hand of God as some, you know, this kind of the, the hand of a despotic ruler instructing, commanding, pointing. But I see his hand like the gentle hand of the conductor of the orchestra that's trying to lead us in a tune. He's trying to lead us in a melody and a harmony that when we follow the conductor's hand, the truth is something of beauty is produced. Now, there's different kinds of music. There's sombre music, there's loud music, there's crashing music, there's quiet music, there's gentle music. But all of it is in order when the conductor's hand is being followed. So, so I hope you understand that, that I see the hand of God involved in our life in that way. He's like, he's like the conductor, gently conducting the music. And if you will submit and pay attention to what that is showing in the movement of life, then your life will come into tune and it will become part of a great orchestrated symphony. So, the fourth man principle, what is it? Well, in, in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, chapter 3, uh, which is a fascinating book, is this book of Daniel. Uh, very weird in some parts. Um, because it, it, it is what they call apocalyptic and poetic. So, it paints a lot of pictures. It's a bit like reading a comic book, you know, of, of strange creatures and all this kind of stuff. And we haven't time to talk about how how that all comes together to make sense. But there are four main characters. Um, well, apart from King Nebuchadnezzar, he's one of the main characters. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but, but four characters it's built around. One is this guy called Daniel, and then there are three other young Hebrew men called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or at least that was their Babylonian names that were given to them. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, these four boys were all... Were all um, taken into captivity when the king of Babylon overran their own home nation, which was we would know as Israel, or Israel and Judah. And uh, they were taken away into a foreign land, but, but there was some favor on them because the king obviously needed people who were ethnically Jewish or Hebrews uh, in order to propagate his kingdom. So these, these four boys were chosen. It's a fascinating story how, how, how their lives were blessed with favor. Uh, I just want to talk about three of these boys just for a moment. They're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These, these three boys um, are notorious for something that they did, which is that um, they became aware of the narcissistic nature of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who is a real historic figure. And uh, he was so narcissistic that he decided, even though he had all these people from other cultures, that, you know, uh, he wanted them to worship his God, which usually meant in those days, me. Okay? And you still got that in the Roman Empire with uh, Caesar was God. Okay? And uh, for some of you, when, when you've read the Bible that says that uh, about saying Jesus is Lord, that was the most dangerous thing you could say in, in, uh, in the first century AD because... Because the saying was in the Roman Empire of that time, Caesar is Lord. So if you said Jesus is Lord, uh, you were actually saying that the king, your ruler Caesar, was no longer Lord. And you can, you can imagine what the punishment for that was. It wasn't pleasant. Uh, and you probably were only going to do it once. So you kind of figure out what the punishment was. And the bravery. Uh, and for me, uh, what authenticates the reality of the gospel because... In that first century, you know, persecution to us is, I told somebody I was a Christian and they laughed at me, you know. Uh, persecution then was, was um, uh, very often severe and vicious and, and could possibly and probably in some environments require you to give your life or deny your faith in Christ. And, and that took a lot of courage. 
And uh, that kind of courage doesn't come from people who are following an illusion or some comic book figure, you know, or some, or some, uh, some, some, some phantom story that's not true. It, because of when that began, so soon after the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's an authentication that either those guys were complete idiots, brain-dead idiots, or they had experienced something so amazing, so remarkable, uh, and so true that, that they were willing to give their lives for it. I, I think that's a pretty powerful authentication of why Jesus' disciples followed him and all of them, um, except John, suffered violent deaths of persecution and, and so it went. So, so, so th- this, was, this was common. Now, of course, and these, these narcissistic rulers of whom Nebuchadnezzar was one built a, a 90-foot-high statue in gold. Okay, that's 30 meters in new money. A 30-meter statue, golden statue, and basically everybody, he had all his musicians go out and everybody had to bow down and worship the, the image of gold. Well, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had enough integrity to say, that's not our king, that's not our God, that's not who we serve, and we don't bow down to, to anything that we do not believe is the reality of the God of heaven. So they wouldn't. So, of course, they stuck out like a sore thumb, you know. I mean, I mean, a lot of us, let's be honest, we would have said, well, just a little bow, you know, just, I really, I really love God, but, you know, I'll just tie my shoelace at the point that the, that the music plays. Oh, did, did I look as though I was bowing? I wasn't really, you know. Those kind of stunts that we, uh, we kind of pull to authenticate our, our following of God. But, but there, is, there is a requirement for boldness, really, in life to stand out for what is true and what is real. Now, of course, the the debate of is it true, I've already given you one of the reasons that authenticates for me that Jesus was who he said he was and therefore his father is is who he said he was. And and so Nebuchadnezzar required that this happen. Well, these boys wouldn't do it, so of course somebody grasped them in. Uh, It's always nice to have friends, isn't it? Somebody grasped them in. And uh, because they worked for the king, they were like in the diplomatic service. He had them in, put them on the carpet, and uh, said, look, here's the deal, boys. You know, I need you to do this. Um, and if you don't, you know, that, that could spread rebellion. So basically, you do it or die. That's your, that's your two choices. And uh, all credit to these boys that said, then I guess we'll have to die because we're not going to do it. That, that's, that's real faith, commitment, and, and integrity to what they had set their hearts upon. So the next time the music goes and all this and everybody bows down, they didn't do the shoe-tying thing, they stood up tall and cause stuck out like sore thumbs and were arrested for, for basically treason against the king, uh, not being willing to, 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 to bow down to, to what he was commanding them to bow down to. They wouldn't submit to peer pressure. They were going to stand out for what they absolutely, in their hearts, believe was reality. And so the king had a, a, a special arrangement for them, which he, he, he had a fire pit dug and, uh, and created a furnace in the fire pit and decided that's where these boys were going, into the fire pit. And uh, sure enough, they didn't, they didn't recant on their on their declaration of they said, no, we, our faith is in God, our trust is in him, and, you know, if you kill us, then you kill us. And, you know, if we die, we die, and if we don't die, then it's all through to God. But, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we are not going to bow down um, to this false image. We're not going to submit to a system that we don't believe in. So they finished up being chucked in the fire. And uh, this is where the story goes now. Um, I, I appreciate that these stories can be looked at and you think, I, I can't see that happening. You know, it's just a, it, it's a miracle too far for me. Um, the three boys there in the, in the furnace. Well, okay, if, if it is, still look at how powerful this principle is because when the king looked into the fire where he'd thrown the three boys, instead of seeing three, he saw four figures walking around in the fire. That in the middle of the fire, somebody had joined the boys that he didn't know who it was, but the description was, which is a fascinating description in the historic text, one like unto a son of man. Okay? 
Or in other words, it was one like unto a son of God who looked like a man who was there in the fire and he was conscious that three went in but four were in the middle of the fire. The top and bottom of the story is this, believe it or not, that, that, that the three boys didn't get burned up. All that they lost was the, was the ropes that bound them. Uh, and they actually were free with, within the fire. Before they came out of the fire, they were free in the fire. And, and, and the story is that the king called them out and, and they came out of the fire, not even smelling of smoke and with no singeing upon them. Their eyebrows were still intact. Uh, absolutely fine. Now again, it, I, I can appreciate how difficult it can be for some people to believe these stories as far-fetched. But, and this was going to surprise some of you. I, I don't care whether it's, whether it's actually real or not. I think it is, but it, that's not the point. The point is that there was a message within it that Daniel was trying to convey that when the boys standing for truth found themselves in the midst of a furnace, that they were not alone. That there was a hand that was guiding them and there was someone that was with them who was able in the middle of the problem to get rid of the bondage, the things that were binding them and tying them and holding them captive and to bring them out not smelling like the situation, okay? Actually smelling like themselves, not like the situation that they had been in, which is a very, very powerful story. Now, now, now there is a difference between bowing to pressure and submitting to process. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are my example of that. They did not bow to pressure. The pressure was, you don't, don't trust in God. Just do what you need to do to get by in life. You know, just do what anybody asks of you. Just go with the crowd. Just go with the flow. Nothing really matters. But they didn't bow to that pressure. What they submitted to was a process. Now, Understand this, in not bowing to pressure, they, that carried with it a consequence. The consequence was the fiery furnace. And for all of us, if we stand for what is right and don't bow to pressure, the consequence might be some fire, some heat, some furnace, some difficulty, some problem, some anxiety, some, some trial. But they submitted to a process, not by naive compliance. Oh, well, we were taught to do this, you know. People like Chris and I and Danny and a few more of you can find ourselves in life doing things because we were taught to do them. It was good teaching. Our, our, our parents, our families taught us those things. Some of you were never there. But the danger is for some of us that we can do things just out of a naivety and compliance, but not in a confident faith. But what they did was not in naive compliance, but by confident faith. And it pr produced a promotion, not an incineration. What happened to the boys is they finished up being promoted to a higher place than they were in the government, in the diplomatic service, than before they went in the fire. So that faith within the midst of the problem, submitting to the process that even included them being thrown into a fire, resulted in promotion, not incineration. That's my point. That when we understand the hand of God is on our life and we begin to submit to the process, even though we realize the process takes us into the fire, what happens is if we do that in confident faith, every time it produces promotion in our life, not incineration. Now, on Tuesday, it will be the 26th anniversary of my taking the senior leadership of this house. 26 years is a long time. And there are miracles that connect to that journey of the hand of God. Now, now, here's what I want to say to you tonight. Don't fight where God is positioning you. See, there are lots of reasons why, because we look at the natural circumstances around us, that we can actually begin to fight where God is positioning us. And I want to show you from a little story of my own life how it's not wise to fight where God is positioning you. Listen to this, it's very important. Hold the reins of control lightly. Speaking this to every one of you. Hold the reins of control lightly. Make room for mystery and miracle. The tighter you hold the reins of control on your life and circumstances, the less you will experience mystery and miracle. 
the looser you hold the reins of control, the more you will experience miracles and mystery. And the greatest thing in life is not you controlling your life, it's the mystery and the miracles that can happen within you. The mystery produces all kinds of adventures. The miracles change all kinds of, kinds of circumstances, physically, naturally, at work, at play, in your marriage, in your relationships. Mystery and miracle only become a, a common reality when we hold lightly the reins of control on our life. It's the same for a church, a family, a house, a ministry, and for those of you that don't realize that God is calling you into something bigger, but you've got such a tight hold of the reins about what you're going to do and where you're going to go and who's going to be involved, that mystery and miracle can't work. Relax. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He meant being connected to me you have to chill a little bit, okay? The more you stress, the more you get tightened up, the more you get yourself into bondage, the less there is room for mystery and miracle. Relax. Salvation's on the way. Relax. So, 33 years ago, almost to the day, but not quite, I was sat in the office of the then principal of York College, which was then York Technical College, out on, um, on Tadcaster Road. And uh, sat in the office of the principal, I was faced with an offer of a lecturing post. Look at you. But I was also uh, presented with the offer of a supported fast track to take me to head of department in the building department. So the head of building department was, was due to retire in about six years to six to seven years from that time. And uh, I was in this amazing position of being sat in the principal's office. First of all, he said, come on, let's make you a lecturer one. We'll, we'll fast track you into a lecturer two. That was to teach in building and building technology. And, uh, and then this is the issue. We're going we're gonna to pay you through university for everything that you need to get you to the level where then when Dr. Watson... <laughs> That was his real name. I'm not, I haven't made that up. When Dr. Watson, there was no Sherlock, but he was Dr. Watson. When, when he retires, the, the plan is that you will move into that, into that role. Fantastic. The same week that I had that conversation with the principal, my father-in-law, who was then the senior pastor of, of this house, which is not then the Rock of York, it was the Assembly of God Church before we changed the name, the same week, sat me down and had a conversation with me. He said, I think it's time. I know the call of God on your life. And uh, I would like to make room for you to come on staff at the church and to become one of the, the ministers, one of the pastors here on staff. That all happened in the same week. Now, that, that was challenging because I had on one hand career and cash. On the other hand, I had to weigh, call, and value. What were the things that I valued in life? I, I, I value my relationship with God. I valued the opportunity to serve God, to be a voice, to, to, to express the kingdom of God, to, to, to help some people to find something outside of the, the natural essence of life, something that flows from God through Jesus to humanity. I wanted to do that, but, but the other thing that I longed to do was right there, on the table. So at that point, not only career and cash, but call and value came into play. And those things become a real test of character and integrity. They become a test of character and integrity as to, as to whether we are prepared to submit our lives to something greater than our own purpose, desire, will, idea, plans. And that can be a little scary. Uh, because the principle who can be seen is here, and the God who can't be seen is here. The principle who can offer me this on a signed contract is here. The God who offers this by a promise is here. 
And in that moment, I had to make a choice that was based on something more than my own thoughts and my own desires. I had to have some sense of where is the hand of God leading me? What is happening? I don't want to fight against where God is positioning me. I want to understand what is happening. I want to hold the reins lightly enough for miracle and mystery to come into the situation. Now, you have to know that 10 years earlier, I had sat in the office of the principal of York's British Rail Engineering Limited Apprentice Training School, when there was a British Rail Engineering Limited, for whom I worked when I left school and had gone as an apprentice. I, I chose to take an uh, apprenticeship. And uh, 10 years before this offer from the principal of York College, for that process that would ultimately was designed to take me to the head of department, I was sat in the office of the principal there in the training school, being told that although I was top apprentice, hark at you, I would not be offered my choice of trade. Now you have to understand, this was unheard of. The whole deal was, if you were the top apprentice, you chose the trade path that you wanted to go. And uh, in those days, everybody thought everybody wanted to be an electrician. That was like, you were bright if you were an electrician. <laughs> of course, the rules changed after me, and they decided to, <laughs> decided to lower the bar a little bit. <laughs> now, me and Phil both worked for the same company, and uh, Phil got that job. But as I sat there, it was interesting because it was like, you know, the whole deal was you, you sought to be the best apprentice in training in the school so that then you could choose, so then you went on. And I remember he sat there and looked across the desk at me, uh, said, I know, you, you know you're the top marked apprentice, you know, in, in all the skills that we've done. And uh, I've seen your choice thing, you know, but I don't want to give you any of your three choices. Um, and this is what he said to me, he said, when I see you, all I can think of is plumber. Now, I don't know how I should have taken that. I don't know how I was supposed to take that. But that's literally what he said. When I, when I see you, all I can think of is plumber. Now, I was gutted, I have to be honest. I was gutted. I was unhappy at my circumstance. But what I did was I chose to set myself in that circumstance to be the best plumber I could possibly be. If that's what I was going to be, I was going to be the best of what it was that I could be. Now, now what I didn't realize at the time was that God's hand was on my life. That there was room for mystery and room for miracle. That something was happening where God was positioning me that if I had reacted wrongly at the time, I don't know where the course of my life would have taken me because I would not have been sat in the principal's office 10 years after that uh, being offered this job and I probably would not have been having the conversation that I had with my, with my father-in-law. Actually, my other career path was that I wanted to be a helicopter pilot in the Royal Navy and I would have pursued that but for a dicky ear. And you think, well, sometimes a dicky ear might be helpful in the process of the hand of God upon your life, that you could whinge about the ear, but maybe the ear kept me away from where I shouldn't have been. I might have been a statistic in the Falklands War now. Might have been. I, I might have been anywhere. Instead of serving God and having the opportunity to help people and bless people's lives all over the world and the wonderful adventure that I had been on, you see, it doesn't all start in one moment. It's all a process of the hand of God gently pushing, gently moving, and being willing to understand that we're not to fight against where God is positioning us just because we don't understand. I didn't understand when that guy looked across the table and said, when I look at you, all I see is a plumber that that actually was the gateway to promotion, not incineration. I served my apprenticeship as a plumber. No, I will not come and fix your leaks or put you a new bathroom in, okay? So don't ask us. I don't want to offend you, so I might as well say it to everybody, okay? I'm not going to do that. 
But what happened to me was amazing because I, they then said, we'll send you to college. I said, send me to college. And they said, well, we'll keep sending you to college. I said, keep sending me to college. So I just kept studying and getting qualifications and never paid a single penny for it. Isn't that good? I didn't need Jeremy Corbyn to promise anything. <laughs> Not a penny. <laughs> Railway paid for it all, which means you paid for it, the taxpayer, because we were a nationalized company. Anyway. Um, What, what was interesting in all, all of that is, is that I served that apprenticeship. I came out of my apprenticeship at 20 years of age. Six months after coming out of my apprenticeship, I was promoted, so I was now inspecting. So, I, you know, the tools went away. The tools were a short-lived thing. And then a year after that, I was also promoted to a very, very good job working for the chief civil engineer of, um, uh, based in the office at... Uh, our main office in, uh, in Derby. It's arc at you. <laughs> uh, basically, my own boss. I was in charge of looking at workshop complexes up and down the country, which I was on my own doing that. Here's the thing it did for me. My time was flexible at a time when I was so heavily involved in wanting to serve God with all of my heart that it meant that my job was not restricting me from doing what God's hand was on my life to do, but because of the job I was now in, it was making the pathway open for me to be able to do what God was looking for me to do. But I didn't know that the day I sat opposite the principal of the training school of BREL. All I know is that I didn't fight what was the positioning of God on my life. And so it moved me forward. And of course, that journey would have taken me. Now, some of you would have been learning under me at York College if they hadn't made me redundant um, in that job. However, you have a greater privilege because I'm serving a higher authority and I can give you greater wisdom. I can give you greater understanding. And rather teaching you about how to build a building that will fall down, I can teach you how to build a life that will last forever and build something meaningful and significant, but all that because God was positioning when I didn't even understand what was happening, and that was the journey that was going on. Unhappy at my circumstance, but chose to set myself in that course. Now that choice set in motion a process that propelled me to places I never imagined. Even in the context of ministry, the, the blessing has been incredible. There's places I've been in the world, the people I've had the opportunity to meet and to speak to and to pray with and to help their lives and to hear has been absolutely incredible. But I don't know where you thought that start, but actually it didn't even start when I sat opposite the, the, the principal of the York Training School. It started even before my parents moved to York while that was going on. But you see what I'm saying to you, all that is going on for you, all that's happening in your life, you may or may not be called to ministry like I am. Some of you may be. Don't fight it. Don't struggle against it. In confident faith, release that, receive that, work with it, submit yourself to that process. But for all of you in life, you need to understand that God is at work. His gentle hand has been orchestrating. If you'll just watch it and submit yourself to listen to it. And so I, I coined this statement many years ago that I want to repeat to you again today, which is this, that the course of your life is not determined by the circumstances you face, but by the choices you make. So many of you in here tonight think that the course of your life has been determined by the circumstances you face. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Now, I can tell you that within that process, I've found myself in adverse circumstances on many occasions throughout my life, and they have often dictated the level of my pain. So I am not denying that, that our circumstances often dictate the level of our pain, but they have never determined my course. My choices have done that. So I have suffered pain from circumstance, and so have you, but the issue is the actual, the, the actual course of your life is not determined by the circumstances you face, but by the choices you make. That word circumstance is a very interesting word because it's made up of two words, circum and stance. Circum is a circumference. It's the shortened version of circumference. Circumference is a circle, circumference. 
And the word stance means that you have chosen to stand within the circle of all that is happening to you. Circumstance means that you are standing in the circle of the stuff that has happened to you. The gospel invites you to step outside of the circle in which you stand into another dimension, which is the grace of God, the life of God, the peace of God, the love of God. But while ever you stay there, you will be convinced that your circumstances are determining the course of your life, but it's your choice to stay under the power of your circumstances that is now controlling your life. It's the choice to be there. You can make a choice not to be the victim of your circumstance. Just like I told you earlier, you can't handle tomorrow, you can't handle yesterday, but you can choose to say, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and then when we move into that next 24 hours, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and move in the next 24, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. So goodness and mercy, God said to David in Psalm 23, will follow you All the days of your life, goodness and mercy. If that was the promise to David back then, it's the promise to you here today. The course of your life is not determined by the circumstances you face, but by the choices you make. So we're nearly done. Let me say this. We spend far too much time trying to change the things that affect our circumstances and not enough time seeking to understand the things that govern our choices. The things that govern our choices are what we've talked about when we don't fight against God's positioning in our life. Even when sometimes that positioning has us in a place where there is a furnace, while ever we all to understand that the orchestra is conducting this, there will be a fourth man in the fire and we walk out of it without bondage, without restriction, without being tied. We walk out as free men and women to a place of promotion. I believe in the blessing of God. I believe in ascendancy in the life of every believer. I believe in ascendancy in your life. I believe in the best for you, that the best is yet to come. I don't believe that the gospel brings us into crushers. It brings us into lifters. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he said, I brought you out of to bring you in too. And he brought them into a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes, there were issues and problems, but the whole thing was one of ascendancy, of help, of blessing, of health, of forgiveness, of provision. And I believe in that gospel. So, let me give you one more verse. Deuteronomy 30, in fact, two verses. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, and then we're going to shut up. From the message version of the Bible. Now, there is a context to this, and uh, uh, one should always try to understand the context, particularly in Old, Old Testament ancient writings, because you can, you can pull things into a wrong dimension. But within here is a wonderful principle that I think stands the test of time and crosses the ages. When, when, when God says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you, it's, we, we think of that as severe. But what he's saying is, I want heaven and earth to witness what is about to happen. Okay? And this is what he said, I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. Now here's the problem. You could assume from that that God's saying, I'll either bless you or curse you, uh, I'll either, uh, and you'll either live or you die. That's not really the context of what it's saying. It's God is really exposing to him that our choice will either take us down a, a path of life or it'll take us down a path of death. It will either take us down a path of blessing or it will take us down a path of cursing But here's the important thing. He says, and so choose, so that your children may live, choose life. Choose life. There is within every one of us the power and the ability to choose life in every situation. Now, you could say, but define what that life is. That life to me is when we submit to the process of the orchestrator, the, 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 the orchestra leader which is God who is, who is using his baton to make the tune so that we don't fight against where God is positioning us, but within those things we realize actually God's hand is on my life. God is with me. I am part of something bigger than this. The circumstance is not determining my situation. My choice is determining, and my choice is that I choose life. When you're thrown into the fire, 
I choose life. I don't choose mourning. I don't choose complaining. I choose life. Now, my experience is this, and I wish I'd done it more, because sometimes I can whinge like the best of you. But whenever you choose life, funnily enough, the fourth man seems to turn up in the problem. It seems that somehow it's not just you, and it's not just you and your wife, or it's not just you and your wife and kids. It's you and your wife and kids, and Jesus, God incarnate, has turned up in the situation and is present, and all of a sudden, the fire's not burning you anymore. It's present, and it's hot, but what it's doing is getting rid of the stuff that stops you moving on to the next level, that stops you stepping into your place of promotion. Choose life. I place before you this. So, so for every one of us tonight, we, we have to make a choice. That's got nothing to do with whether God loves you because God does love you. It's nothing to do with whether God's blessing is on you because ble God's blessing is on you or God's favor, God's favor is on you. But in the process of this, it's important that you say, I choose life. I love it says that you and your children will live. It goes bigger than just our own selves. It, it, it expands beyond our own, our own boundary of life. And then he goes on verse 20 to say, it says, and love God, your God, listening obediently to him, firmly embracing him. Oh yes, he is life itself. A long, a li long life settled on the soil that God, your God, promised to give. Now in theirs it was a context, but it's a long life settled on the soil that God has promised to give you, the place that God has promised to give you by firmly embracing him because he is life itself. Empty philosophies that include godlike figures are not enough to bring you to the place of miracle and mystery. But a real commitment to the God that this is talking about, who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their situation, is the one that we embrace. And I guarantee you, when you embrace him in that process, there is promotion that is beginning to flow. There is freedom from the things that are binding you. You can get out of the place of heat and realize that actually all along, God had his hand on your life. The orchestra is us. The leader is God himself, and over your life is winding the baton, and just asking you to be part of the tune that is your life under the direction of his hand and his leading, appreciating that he is interested, making music of your life and my life, and realizing that when you look back, something was happening that was determining a course for you that as you chose just to be the best within it, because God is with you today, because this is the day the Lord has made, that as you see that unfold, you realize that there is something beautiful that God is doing and wants to do with you. Don't fight against where God is positioning you, but submit yourself to it and let the beauty of that miracle begin to be part of your life. It's already happening for some of you right now. In fact, I could say it's already happening for all of you right now, but you're at varying degrees. But I believe the more that we begin to pay attention to the one who is orchestrating and say, God, I can't see all this, but I submit to what it is that you are doing. But in that loving God, honoring God, serving God, worshiping God, saying, I'm in your embrace, I want you to know that the blessing of heaven is promised to you and it is a reality. Just bow your heads for one moment. Father, we thank you, or I thank you, for what you're doing, for what you're capable of doing, for who we are and who we can be. And Lord, I ask tonight that for each of us, there will be a submitting, a yielding, a giving in within the process that we find ourselves in. Some finding themselves right now in the midst of a furnace and uh, and tempted to turn their back on you. But I pray for each one that's in that position that there will be an understanding to make a choice, to say, Lord, you, 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 I'm not letting the fire put me off. I know that it's, it's difficult and it's hot. But then to see that the fourth man has turned up in the fire and the deliverance has already begun. I pray for everyone who's wrestling with what they should do, the choices for the future. 
that your word will be clear, that things will happen within that orchestration that make clear. I pray as well that for everyone who just is confronted with something that might not be what would be their first choice, but is coming before them right now that they're wrestling with, just like me all those years ago, that peace will come and a settledness will come within that situation to realize that you are positioning for something much greater and that as I walk into that positioning, you then have a process that is going to follow that, that is going to lead me to where your blessing is, 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 is flowing and exploding in so many directions. And so God, let there be peace in this house. Help us to get rid of the stress and the anxiety and the worry and settle ourselves into the wonder of your presence with us, into the mystery and the miracle when we hold the reins loosely. Help us to stop being so white-knuckled on what we're trying to do to direct the course of our life and just to let go of the reins, just let go of the reins. And just to relax the reins, to see that as we do that, mystery and miracle starts to take over in our life. Let that be a reality. I pray for every heart, for every life here today, for every family, for every future, for every ambition, for every hope, for every dream, for every sickness, for every need to come under that, that, that blessing today as we just... Loosen those reins for mystery and miracle to become a reality. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.